My name is Jonathan Edelman from Mississippi State University. I uh, also want to thank everyone here, especially Professor Velker um, and the Templeton Foundation for the wonderful awards from the really, it, uh, for, the, for the lavishness of it all. And um, I, um, it's been genuinely helpful on so many levels and uh, deeply appreciate it. And really, I want to say that it has propelled me to take the idea of Hindu theology more seriously. It was in the background of the award that, uh, the book that I, for which I received the generous award. Um, but since receiving that, I think I've been propelled into uh, thinking about what does it mean to be a Hindu theologian in the contemporary world. And I want to bring out today um, some questions and some um, work that I've been doing and thinking about this, this issue and to, in some sense, problematize and, and show the areas in which it will be very difficult, I think, to bring a genuine Hindu theology into the sort of science and religion dialogue that's going on here. So in this paper, I want to specifically look at what is the, what, how is constructive work to be undertaken when we talk about the relationship between Hinduism and science? What are the good and what are the bad methodological pro processes one might use? And my, my argument here is that in addition to understanding the Western science and philosophy and theology correctly, the constructive work in Hinduism um, and science must grow out of a genuine Hindu theology or a Hindu philosophy. And there is a difference between the two. And I'd like to outline, at least today, given the shortness of time, some of the distinctive features of what Hindu theology is about. So I'm recognizing that there's a difference between the sort of historical work that one might do and more constructive work. But even the historical work, I think, depends upon uh, a, a clear understanding of what Hindu theology is and how Hindu thinkers were thinking. Um, so my goal here is really to make some suggestions to you, and I, I recognize that this is, the dialogue is primarily framed in a, in a Christian, a Protestant Christian sort of framework. So my, what I'm saying, what I want to suggest here is how can you evaluate good constructive work within Hinduism and science, within Hindu theology and of science? Because I understand that many of you will be the decision makers on articles that get published in journals and books and so on and so forth. So therefore I want to talk about uh, how we can think about constructive work here. And so there is no such thing as Hindu theology per se. Rather, we have very distinct traditions. So I'm going to be talking about one specific tradition. This is Sri Chaitanya from the late 15th century. He is considered a form of, of God, of Krishna. Um, he, wrote very, he wrote nothing at all. He was absorbed in the love of God. And so he actually had said he wrote a book on logic, but eventually threw it and the river, and he cared not for it. So it was up to his, his disciples, his early disciples, known as the Goswamis. There was a group of men who lived in North India, uh, of highly learned, highly educated families, who worked together to form what you might call a corporate theology. They took on different areas of theology, epistemology, metaphysics, aesthetics, and so forth, poetics, and so forth. So they are the early 16th century founders of what's known as uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava or Vaishnava Hindu school. They focused on bhakti or love of, of the Lord as the highest aim of life. They argued that this is the true and way, the right way to understand all of the Hindu scriptures. And after, it's, it's interesting that these group of thinkers argued against Shankara, who we heard about um, a few days ago or yesterday, that they said that Shankara actually negated the possibility of love, and we, that's something we could talk about later if we have time. So my, my goal here is really to talk about what are the distinctive features of theology in this particular tradition. So first of all, this, these theologies all arise out of tradition. They're a very traditionally oriented group of people. Um, the word used here is sampradaya. Sampradaya is a body of teaching that is passed down, and it is believed that there is a chain or a lineage of, of teacher to student that descends far back in time. 
One can generally tell which tradition a thinker is working at out of by looking at the introductory verse. They will praise a particular guru or a particular god and you know then what, what they're working out of. So in each of these theologies, there's a concerted effort to show how one's school is based upon a defensible interpretation of the canonical Hindu texts. For example, the Veda, uh, the Veda Samhitas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedanta Sutra, the Puranas and Tantras and so forth. The arguments that they make are something like, this is what you should understand from these teachings, from these scriptures, and this is what has been passed down, and this is what will be passed down. So every Hindu thinker, theologian, is trained within a distinctive school of thought. I just note a general problem with much of the constructive work in Hinduism and science today is that you don't get a tradition-oriented perspective. There is this attempt to represent Hinduism in general, which is very difficult. It's something like representing Abrahamism in general. It's a, it's a big project that's doomed to failure. The second feature is theology as, a, as systematic and exegetical. The scholars working within the Vaishnava tradition find themselves with a big problem. They've got a massive textual canon. For example, they work from a book called the Bhagavata Purana. It's 18, approximately 18,000 verses. They want to show how the Bhagavata Purana is consistent with other texts like the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedanta Sutra, the Upanishads, and a host of commentaries on them. So we're talking about a, a vast corpus of text. How to make sense of this? First, they need to order it and say these are the general um, principles, the theological principles within the text. They select out of them. They go through and they argue that this is what the, these are the five or ten principles that the text is really teaching. Once they've done that, they can, um, once they've ordered it, they can begin internal and external overcoding. Internal, uh, external overcoding is when a tradition um, says that other traditions are not wrong they're just to be subjugated underneath one. So Hindus generally do not discount other schools of thought or other religions. What they want to say is that, in general, that they are just lesser forms of their own religion. So there's this overcoding. Hindu thinkers in this Vaishnava tradition also overcode within their own textual corpus. They also want to say that there are general theological principles within their own texts some of which are lesser, of lesser importance than others. So they've ordered the text into, say, 10 different theological principles, and then they're going to tell you these are the most important ones. The rest, not so important. Once they've done this, they can begin uh, formal exegesis, going through each verse word by word, line by line, and giving interpretations of them. But this interpretation is very rule-bounded. They have to follow certain... Um, principles. They follow the principles of grammar, paninis ashtadhyayi. There is a great Sanskrit grammar, and they say you cannot interpret a text outside of the, the uh, sort of an objectively, um, an objective standard of grammar canonized by someone named Panini. It has to follow logic. There is an Indian school of Nyaya, and they all agree that when making arguments, even exegetical arguments, it has to follow a certain logical sequence. This is agreed to. They have to use standard dictionaries when they're giving alternative definitions of words within scripture, such as the Amra Kosha. And they have to look at how words are used in other scriptural texts and other commentaries. So although this is a very rule-bounded activity from this, these rules, nevertheless, they're able to generate a tremendous amount of fecundity. It's amazing sometimes at the creativity they're able to find within these fairly strict rules. And finally, there's signification. Once you've, you've done all of these things, then you can begin to tell the reader, the believing reader, what the significance of the text is to that reader. He, the theologian, might invest his own understanding of the objects about what it's speaking, go beyond the text, so to speak. This is, uh, these are the, the subtle meanings of the text that are not directly read in the text, but sort of can be extrapolated out of it. And lastly, Theology is polemics between exegetical schools. It's rare that a Hindu thinker, whether a philosopher or a theologian, will step out of the Sanskritic dialogue. More or less, it was assumed for hundreds, thousands, thousands of years, perhaps, but at least hundreds of years, that if you're not writing in Sanskrit, 
then there's really very little we can say to you. And this provides itself with a lot of different problems. So in concluding, uh, I want to look at some steps forward. Given this picture of how rationality works, Hindu ration in this particular tradition works, what can be done? First thing that could be done is to reframe and translate traditional Hindu theological terms and forms of rationality into 21st century Western academic terms and uh, concepts and forms of, of, of thinking. That's more or less what I tried to do with my first book was take this type of dialogue and put it in, in an academically defensive, defensible way. A second option is to translate Western terms. You might translate natural selection or Jesus Christ into Sanskrit and then allow Hindu theologians to, to think about it in their own indigenous uh, terminology and in their own indigenous ways of thinking about these issues. That's, I think, less preferable because who's going to be able to write that, first of all, today? And second, who's going to be able to read that? It'll be a very closed dialogue. A third option, and this is the option that I've, thanks to much of the work done with the Templeton Foundation, have come to see is the most preferable option. Hindu theological schools could animate themselves on Western soil and in European as well as the Sanskrit languages with an eye towards history and with, their own, with, with an eye towards their own tradition. In this context, old texts can be studied in old ways, but in conversation with Western thought. And they, they, they can thereby rethink themselves and help the West to rethink itself. Western academically trained theologians, philosophers, and historians are then invited into an existing Hindu theological dialogue from which they can possibly benefit. And I think this is something that needs to happen next where there has to be something like a, a genuinely Hindu theological dialogue somewhere within the academic sphere, but that's going to require a lot of time. It's going to require a lot of people willing to come forward and start to build, build that up. And uh, so I'll, I'll close there. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time.